Hello and welcome to Impact Africa, our online talk show where we get to have conversations with diverse people and organizations who are impacting lives positively. Yes, this is me, Kemi Akiode Adibayo, aka Mama K. In today's program, we've got my dear sister. This one is my blood sister, cousin. Um, she is a dynamic lady, selfless, passionate about what she does, intelligent, compassionate. I go on and on about her. Dr. Abiola Akiode Afolabi. She's the founder director of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center. W-A-R-D-C for short. She is based in Lagos and walks across Nigeria and Africa and the world, actually. So, my dear sister, cousin, friends, uh, mentor, what else do you like on you? You know you play so many roles. And, you, you know, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at myself. People are right. We look so much alike. This is like me looking at myself. Welcome <laughs> to Black Africa. How are you today? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very fine. Thank you very much. Um, coming after like a one week of struggle or two weeks. Uh, so I had to just uh, rush back to Lagos to have my breath before going back to continue occupying the National Assembly in Nigeria. Okay. Before we go on to your work and what you do, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Education, life growing up? Did you have any influential person in your life? What? And then we'll go on to your, your work <laughs> in terms of your career. So tell us, let's know more about you. Yeah, well, um, I was born in uh, about 50 uh, something years ago uh, in, in Lori, uh, Quara State. And um, so I grew up in Ushubu. Um, and when I, I had my primary school at St. Francis Primary School, then um, later I moved to Oshibu Primary School. Then from there, I went to the uh, Obafemi, normally as a lawyer, you go to Nigeria Law School. And from Nigeria Law School, I went, I, I got a scholarship and um, I went to University of Notre Dame to do my master's program. And uh, then later on, I decided to uh, I'll go for my, uh, my doctoral degree, which um, I did at um, University of London. So I've actually gone through Africa to the US, to London to study. And um, so currently I head the Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center, WOTC. And um, also I lecture at the University of Lagos uh, as a law lecturer in the Department of Public Law. Um, so uh, growing up was quite interesting uh, for me. I, I think I started activ activism at the age of 13 uh, when I was in uh, what they call GSS3 now. Uh, and some youth coppers were in my school. And uh, we realized that they take, uh, we have some grown up in our class. You know, we were like 13, but we had people that were 18 and 19, 20 in class. So we went, uh, some young teachers come into class, take those uh, young, those uh, older people out, out of the class and they took, take them to maybe staff quarters and all of that. And so rather than teaching us in school, they, they do that for like two hours every day. So at the point we felt that was wrong. So I climbed the table and I started banging the table that we must <laughs> stop this then the principal of the school came and so <laughs> that was our investigation panel was set up and they realized that uh, they were actually arresting the uh, other one in class and uh, they were abusing them you know and um, that was how I started activism so from there I, I knew that if you fight you can win. at the age of 13 yes if you ask if you the old people accountable you know that people can be held accountable so that was how i started so i started debating in school after that they called they were calling me gunifying me inside you know in, in the school and i was feeling very comfortable with myself so i started building that human right career you know mm. from there and so 
I started um, a literary and debating club as the head of the club by the year, by my fourth year. So we're debating about South Africa, apartheid, yellow journalism, military era in Nigeria, how that is affecting, was affecting the country. So meaning that at my secondary school days, I was exposed to understand because before you can go and do a debate on apartheid, you must understand the context. So I started reading wider than my mates, you know, understanding the context of global politics, you know, history, you know, and what have you. Mm. So, and I was winning some of those debates at uh, the local national level. So that was how I started off. So by the time I got to the university, it was obvious that I was going to be involved in students union politics. You know, then I knew that uh, I just have a voice. You know, I don't want to pass through the university like any other person. You know, I, I wanted to leave my footprints, you know, in the standard life. So I, I became the first female Public relations officer of the Students Union. I was uh, arrested severally. I was uh, thrown out of the school. You know, severally at the point my father was not sure. Well, <laughs> and my uncle no, was not sure. Get to finish school. <laughs> that, was, that was in school, you know. Uh, but the point is, uh, the state security during the military era came into my house to pick my father up for questioning, you know. So I was actually at the point I was in exile. So I have to stay in the University of Lakes with the like of um, Shawara, who is now the head of Sahara Reporter, you know, because they, they, we needed some uh, kind of security, you know, in school. So I was there for like about six months. You know, I could not go out of the school because if I if I stepped out, I would have been picked up. So I I grew up in that kind of regard. So by the time I became a lawyer, I knew I was going to be a human rights attorney. So and mm -hmm. I started it off right that I started working with uh, the Human Rights Africa. So. So I educated myself in a lot of cases without the decades in the educational system. Um, so it was so it was growing up was like that. It was like that. Wow, what an interesting and unusual, you know, life of growing up. Some I didn't even know. So I'm hearing some of this for the first time. And I'm like, yo. <laughs> So, but I believe you were called definitely, you know, for this purpose. I know we're having a bit of um network challenge you know if you if you guys are watching forgive us there's nothing we can do but we'll this is between nigeria and south africa we don't know who to blame you know in terms of where the network you know freezing is coming from so now let's go on to your organization the uh, wdc tell us what you actually you started it when it was started and um, why it was started and you know what you do in the organization and anything else you want to share success story one success story and any challenge you've had and how you've managed you know to overcome some of the challenges i'm sure you've had lots but just pick one for us yeah okay um the women advocates research and documentation center see uh started in the year 2000 now, when I was uh, describing my uh, sojourn, I talked about being at the University of Notre Dame. Um, one of the requirements in, at the University of Notre Dame is that when you finish, you're expected to go and do, have an internship with a uh, um, program with um, one of the institutions in the, in, anywhere around the world. So I selected International League for Human Rights. So I was there and uh, they work around the issue of journalism, uh, supporting journalists to escape uh, dissidents, uh, um, and military, uh, militaristic um, experiences, and all of that. So, but when I got there, I wanted to yeah. walk around the issue of women. So I was telling them that we should do something with respect to women. So that was not their <laughs> area of focus. Now, something happened in Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria has started off uh, Sharia. Um, they introduced Sharia. Sharia is, uh, Nigeria is basically 50 50 Islamic and, you know, uh, Christian. Uh, Christian. So, but the Islamic states. And traditional, about, before the traditional. traditional people, yes. It's the northern somewhere. states. <laughs> yeah, the, the northern states uh, um, decided to introduce it in other states, decided to introduce the Sharia uh, code, meaning that um, um, Sharia then will be governing the personal life of people, uh, which was 
but now beyond the personal life now it became, mm. becomes like another criminal code you know and then um, so there was this case of a lady who was uh i'd to have committed adultery i think it was safia and that um they so they gave a judgment that the lady should be stoned to death and because of that mm. i felt there was a need for us to investigate whether they have the capacity to introduce Sharia penal code in Nigeria. So I tried to sell that idea to the uh, International League for Human Rights, and they bought the idea. So we did a proposal, and we sent to Foundation, and Ford Foundation approved the proposal. So the proposal was to look at women's rights within the context of Sharia in Nigeria, and to build like a campaign around the fact that um, mm -hmm. that lady was to be stored to right. So that was how I started. So I started with campaigning that Sharia, Shafia must not die, you know, uh, because adultery, yes, they said she committed adultery. You can't commit adultery alone, you know. So it shouldn't be the woman that should suffer for the, you know, uh, act of the husband, the uh, adulterer, and, you know, and all of that. So yeah. we started that campaign. So it was tagged, Safia must not die. And so that was how uh, what she started. So it was on that basis. So we started challenging the issue of constitution. We started supporting women, uh, legal hate issues. We started supporting children, working around issue of democracy and political participation. So today we are we have a lot of uh, intervention that we've made in the country with respect to the issue of women's rights. Uh, today we have have about Texas state across Nigeria that signed the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law, which supports the rights of women against violence, uh, child abuse, uh, domestic violence, uh, widowhood practices, female genital mutilation, and all sorts of abuses. And we worked with organizations across Nigeria to ensure that about 31 states in Nakava, the most exciting one for me is getting the northeastern state where there is conflict, where there is insurgency, mm -hmm. where there is serious uh, religious bias, you know, get you know male dominated state house of assemblies to agree with us, you know, to pass those laws, uh, and that was what we did all through the COVID time. And for me, that was a story of COVID, you know, because we got the opportunity, we got that opportunity that we can get those laws passed during that period. And I didn't want us to miss that period, so we. We went to the northern part of Nigeria when there was that um, danger of COVID, and I got COVID in one through that, you know, engagement. Mm -hmm. I'm happy today that the six states in northern Nigeria, the north is Nigeria, passed that law. Wow, well done. You know, despite mm -hmm. the threat that we even had, mm -hmm. you know, to our life. So, so those were some of the uh, uh, interventions that we have made over time. We have visited what they call the Women in Parliament Summit. Right. The Women in Parliament Summit is support women who are in parliament you know the way the media portray you know women even if you are in parliament even if you are in high places it's always a very a challenge uh they look at you it's, it's some form of sex objectification so yes. they will tell, tell us about how beautiful they were how well dressed they were rather than telling us about the intervention that those women are making what they're doing in the mm -hmm. so we instituted the women in parliament uh summit with the women in parliament committee of the uh of the National Assembly. And what they do is to put together on yearly basis efforts that women have made in their different constituencies as a way of portraying the better, the better side of women. Mm. Rather than their looks and then, you know, uh, other things. So, uh, so today we have that as an institute, it's something that has become uh, a yearly affair, like an annual event to bring many parliament together. We have also done cases for over 5,000 indigent women across Nigeria. Uh, we have won some of those cases, and one of the most interesting cases was the case of sexual harassment, which led to the conviction, uh, two years conviction for a professor that has served the university for 40 years, but who yeah. has a practice and pattern of sexually harassing students. Hmm and exploiting them. Professor Adele of uh, Obafemi Awolowo University. And it was a very highly celebrated case uh, where mm -hmm. he was sent to jail for the first time for sexual harassment in Nigeria. We have also won cases at the regional level, at the ECOWAS court, wow. uh, a case of a police officer that poured hot soup on his wife and mutilated the wife. You know, we mm -hmm. went to Nigerian, Nigerian police refused to prosecute the police officer because they thought it was against the, uh, the police institution. So, and, we, and they said there was no case. For him to answer. So we took them to Ecowas Court. Ecowas Court asked Nigeria to pay 100 million as compensation to the woman, to the woman for Nigeria failure, you know, to take mm. this mm. step 
you know, to address the case of Mary Sunday. So these are some of the cases that we have done. We run a shelter. We run a full shelter, you know, based in the state uh, where we support women. So we have had over 200 women pass through that shelter. Okay. And through that shelter, we give, we give them uh, some find the kind of economic empowerment because we know that there's a, between, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a linkage between women not having um, economic not being economically empowered and violent so we we also work around that so our work has we have had several challenges uh, <laughs> um uh, for example, there's a problem with political will in Nigeria. So even when you push, uh, there's this misogynist pushback, you know, against uh, women. Uh, you know, we've worked for over 20 years and over up to today. Uh, the constitution is still not sensitive, you know, to the needs of women. You know, which is what led us to occupy the, the NAS. There is this uh, misogynist uh, attitude, you know, in the country that keeps pushing back at women. So when you make a mile, you just see them bring you back about five mm. miles. Again, so we keep, uh, you know, your people say you carry your load and you rearrange it again, you know, so we keep rearranging, you know, our luggage, you know, every time. So we have decided to push back this time around uh, so that we fight it and, you know, end it one, once and for all. And I think it's gradually paying back uh, out of the five gender bills that were thrown out by the National Assembly recently. About three of them have been, you know, relisted for reconsideration. Oh, so currently, oh, we are trying to lobby and also insisting that uh, they must give us the, you know, five gen yeah. bills that we are asking for. Wow, I really, you know, there's so much you've said there that you've achieved, and how you started, you know, with with uh, the word C and the challenges and even still ongoing now there's just so much you know there but you know what we'll be right back mm -hmm. are we okay Olabi, what a genius, what a woman. Your journey from age 13, being an activist at such an age, you know, fighting for the right of your classmates and being involved, you know, in the debates, your schooling in Nigeria, um, you know, then you moved on to London to get your doctorate as well. And wow. You are so blessed. The gender bills you're fighting for, and all the women you've been, all the women you've been supporting, the young girl in terms of the adultery, the woman rather in terms of the adultery. There's so much. We really commend you for all of that. And I know I normally do that at the end, but I'm just so fascinated because some things I was aware of, some things I wasn't aware. So I, you know, maybe because you're family, I take you for granted as well. That I, you know, but. Mm -hmm. Kudos to you. I salute you. Keep keeping the flag. Keep, you know, empowering women and keep doing the best you can in terms of what you do. Um, you. Let me now go a little bit now to, you know, your work with terms of the women empowerment and some of what you do. Um, I know the United Nations this year had the theme of break the bias, you know, for the Women's Day for this year, which I think should be for throughout the year or you know, as opposed to one day, uh, but it should be something that everybody should be implemented. So what are your views you know, in terms of um, breaking the bias and what more can be done, you know, to break the bias and to improve gender equality? Um, thank you very much. Um, there are several spheres of life that we need to break the bias from. Um, culture, tradition, our legal system, our political system, in workplaces, in school, you know. So, because women have been faced with um, 
bias all their life anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up, you know, has been uh, challenging for women and girls. Um, because you're a woman, it's a, it's a problem on its own. Because you're a girl, it's a problem on its own, especially in our cultural Africa. Um, there are several things that, are, that we need to do to break this uh, biases that we're talking about. We need to have a legal framework that is um, sensitive you know, to the needs of men and women. Um, mm. I would understand that um, if you have a twin, 13 year old going to school, a boy and a girl, when you pack their school stuff, you don't buy, you won't pack the same thing. You know, you have to pack different things for them. So and I think that that's a kind of gender lens that the uh, state need to wear. So that when mm. you are discussing a break, you must know that there are over 70 women who are small older women farmers. So when you are making your budget or making your policies and around agri, you cannot look at farmers as just men. You know, you look at a kind of tractor that will be compliant mm. you know, when the woman wears skirt or who wears wrapper, you know, to enter into such tractor. So we need to get policy making to that extent. It's at that point that policy making becomes human and not just making policy, you know, for the fun of it. So uh, that Google lens, that uh, gender, gender lens becomes very important you know, yeah. to be able to break that bias. And it, it has to permit, you know, all through uh, economy, legal, and that's mm. where you have some country up to today. You know, in, even in terms of nationality, women don't have like full nationality rights, you know, like yeah. the men, you know, because the, 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 the lens with which they look at it, they are not even seeing the women there at all. Mm. So we must have governance that is that sensitive that would be able to see, you know, the need of boy, the need of boys, the need of girls, the need of women, the need of men, and that's where we have um, we, we, we will be we will successfully break that bias. At the sphere of religion, there are a lot of um, religious texts that have been misread, you know, to give more power, you know, to the man. And you see, the dynamic of power in growth is very important where there is an hierarchy uh, that the man is the head of the family and the woman is just, you know, and that's why you see that for a very long time, most of the uh, religious sects, they don't have uh, women as leaders, not of recent with the Pentecostal, you know, that we have that, which is part of, so we need to break that bias in religion. After all, Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ. And, you know, you can see also that the bias started even from our own time. So I imagine mm. maybe an uneducated woman who has no voice, no, and that's why when the Bible talks about those who, who wrote about Jesus Christ, they were basically Peter, Paul. You didn't see Mary. Maybe if Mary had written about the birth of Jesus Christ, it would have been different. A different maybe perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, would have had more. So, and what mm. that shows to us is that historically, women mm. have been uh, marginalized. Their voices have not been heard. And so we can see that from religion. And what I'm trying to bring into that is that, what it then means is that we have a long history of injustices against women. So if you then want to break that bias, it's not a day job. It's a torturous journey. You know, right. it's a marathon. It's not yeah. a single spirit, you know. So yeah. in, in doing that, we need to have a lot of strategies to address those biases. And we don't expect to win tomorrow. You know, we don't expect to win the biases tomorrow, you know. So it's something that we need to invest in, educating communities, creating awareness in traditional setting, engaging those people that are participants in the mm. bias mechanism. Because if we don't engage them, we cannot break the bias. If So bringing men on board becomes very important, you know, yeah. in the advocacy for... Uh, breaking the bias for gender equality. They must come to an understanding of how the, the, the merits of the biases that we see on daily basis to our mm. economy, to our to our everyday life, you know. So these are some of the things that we need to do, you know, to be able to get, so for example, the issue of budgets becomes very important. That's what they call the gender budgets. 
we need to have a budget that is sensitive. We can't keep passing laws and we're not putting our mouths where our money is. So if we are passing laws to address violence against women or to stop early child marriage, we must have budget that can make the institution work for us. In some countries, I think for, for example, in South Africa, they're doing better in terms of building institutions around mm. sexual harassment, sexual and gender-based violence. But in some countries in Africa, like Nigeria, we still have a long way to go. If you pass mm. laws and you are not investing, you know, in that law, then it becomes very problematic mm. to realize what you have. So I think that there's a need to do to, in, in, in that regard, to break the bias, we need awareness, community awareness. There is a lot of community acquiescence, acquiescence to subjugating the rights of women. They would just say, "Oh, that's the way tradition is. Just, just leave it." That's why we still have widowed practices today, where somebody yeah. husband dies in the east part of Nigeria, they wash the body of the husband, lock her up in a room, you know, ask the woman to drink the body, drink. Sleep, you know, things like that. You know, whereas when the man, when the woman dies. That very day, some custom and tradition, they bring a young woman. Exactly. Like, oh, I, I know that way. They sleep on yeah. the same bed with the man, so that the man, so that the woman does not come back, you know, to disturb or distract the man. So we we still have all that, you know, in our tradition. So that's why I said it's not it's not something I will come mm. achieve tomorrow, you know. It's something right. that. So we understand that as feminists, we understand the difficulty in breaking these barriers, in pushing back this misogynist, you know, attitudes, but we cannot relent in our efforts. We need to work together. We need to network. We need to bring a, an African-wide coalition, build alliances across mm -hmm. states, and countries, you know, so that we all, you know, uh, impact Africa together. Africa has a lot of potential. There are very great dynamic women, you know, in Africa. And we can see them all over. We have them at the UN. We have them at um, the African Development Bank. We have them at the World Bank. You know, we have them doing well everywhere. But we need to bring the strength of these women together and break that dichotomy between the women in the grassroots and the elite women. The elite women cannot continue thinking that, oh, nobody can, I'm a professor, nobody can you know, um, discriminate against me. Mm. You know, we ask, mm. but we're just supporting those women in grass. They must understand that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. Your it level. doesn't matter what yeah. money you have or your level. Yeah. When it comes to your time, if you lose your husband today, even if mm -hmm. you're a professor, the yeah. same rule that we apply to that woman, you know, that's in the community would apply to you. You can push back a little bit, but it would not make them feel that that rule should not apply to you. So we must break that disconnect, you know, and ensure that we carry the grassroots women along as we move along. Wow. So my dear sister, with your experience, your skills, your journey, both, you know, life, work, education, what would you say is the definition of success and what qualities you know does one need in your perspective as a leader because you're a great leader and uh lastly what are the tips you could you'll give anyone a younger biola now 13 year old biola to say life lessons you know for you to follow i know it's a, it's a condensed about one to hear yeah, just no game of it you know if you don't mind Oh, okay. Um, success to me is um, not about money. Um, it's not about wealth. For me, it's about the impact that you make in the lives of others. Uh, success to me is about your humanity and um, your ability, you know, to be able to support um, others and. Um, the people that you impact and how what you do change their lives. Um, that's the way I see success. Um, I tell people I am not interested in amassing wealth, so it's not about the money that uh, you want to make. Um, I see a lot of my friends who we were in school together have become senior advocates of Nigeria, meaning that more money for them and all of that, you know. But um, some of them are heading banks and all of that. I recall that um, 
when I was to do my heat service, I was actually sent to a, 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 a oil and gas company. You know, when um, there was no money in this country, they were supposed to be paying quite a lot of money. But I reject, I asked for a rejection letter because that's not my calling, you know. Mm. So, so, so success to me, it's uh, more about impact, you know, uh, that we make in life. So that's, that's what I would see as success. Okay. And in terms of qualities for a leader, but that has probably helped you as well, because you're a good leader, you're a passionate leader. Um, so what qualities does one need to become a leader? I, I think um, first and foremost, um, you, you, it's important to be determined to have clear goals. Where, where am I going? What do I want to do? you know, in life. And I think it's something that we need to decide quickly, early in life. So we need to begin to talk to young people about that. Uh, you know, I recall that when I was, um, my uncle was a model, a role model to me, uh, growing up because he was very close to my father and uh, he happens to be a lawyer. So I recall when I was in my uh, uh, primary three, they asked me what would like to before. And I spelled lawyer as L-O-Y-A and you know, it was fun to the like to the teachers, you know. But you know, in a way, I think I was already making a decision. So I think we should encourage young people uh, to make decisions early because it also help it will help them. When I started off, I was um, um I, I started off studying English, but I, I came back three years later to read law, you know, meaning that there's that determination. I was mm. clear about what I wanted to be, you know, even at that point in time of my life. So determination is very important. We need to be determined. We need to set clear goals uh, so that we don't get distracted. You know, mm. um, at every point in life, there's a possibility of peer distraction. There's a possibility of other mm, way of distraction. You know, even at our own, uh, at age 50 plus, you still get distracted. So you need to yes. be focused. You need to be focused. You need to know what you want to do. You need to know what your calling is. And you need to believe in yourself. You know, mm. believing in yourself is also very important. You need to believe in God. You also need to believe in, your, in yourself. You know, so that you also understand what your capacity is. What you can do and what you cannot do. There are things that I know I don't have capacity for. So if you ask me, you know, to work on it, I'll tell you no. I'm not into technology. I'm not into science. Even if you have all the money in this world, and you ask me to come and do something around science and technology, I will tell you I cannot do it because I don't have capacity for it. So we we also need so that that being focused is very important. That being determined is very important. Mm -hmm. And you need to carry people along. You know, okay. as a leader, you can lead from the back. You know, and also still be at the front. You know, so consultation becomes very important. Uh, they call me the general in Nigeria because. Um, I believe in mobilizing people. Mm. You know, I believe in mobilizing people. So I do a lot of consultation and I keep my friends, I keep my network because it's very important to keep friends and network. When we started this uh, occupying women occupying us, it just cost me calls. I just had to call mm. women in business. I had to call women in corporate governance and say we need support we need people to bring water we need people to bring food we are going to be having about three thousand people on daily basis in front of the national assembly hmm. you know i need to call people to say my sister and will be you have to be here with me you know i can't be there alone all of us have to be together and they are there you know and they become you know the uh leaders in that movement you know today so hmm. so my point is that we need to work with people and people need to also believe in you. So we need to have a record of you know, consistency. People know where you stand at every point in time. One of my mm. friends told me of Enough Enough has told me that when, when you called me, I said to myself, even if we don't go, I know I'll be able to go with, even if it's 20 people, because she believed that that's the step that we need to take now. Yeah. You know, I'd rather join her because I know she will go, she will go with 20 people and stand in front of that National Assembly. If, those mm. are the 20 people that she has been able to convince. You know, so we, we need to, so people, so we need to, over time, build who we are. You know, because what people think about you matters and what people say about you also matters. So I, I think that 
um, that, 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 those are the things that I think a leader should wow. have. That was, was a lot. Yeah, that was a lot them. in there in terms of qualities, in terms of lessons, and in terms of you know sharing, you know, with others. And that, that was a lot that you packed in there. Uh, very profound. Now my closing question. I know we've gone over time, but I can't let you go without asking this one. Is I know you do a lot of work, you know, in different on different social issues from women. Uh, gender-based violence, disability, um, a, a lot. So which one or any one maybe that we're not even aware of that you want to pick on, that you're passionate you know, about or that you would like to see changes on and what are the solutions? You know, even if they're possible or not possible, you know. So I just want to hear that from you for Nigeria or Africa as a whole. Hey, um, I think my went off. I oh, your yeah, internet went off. Okay, network. Okay, so I'm asking, which I know you're passionate and into disability, gender-based um, uh, violence, women issues, human rights issues. But I'm thinking there must be something else that you're maybe passionate about that you would like to see, you know, some kind of solutions to. But I rather want you to share your own solution to it. So just one item out of anything. Okay, well, I, I'm very passionate about decision making, not only in politics, you know, but to permit in all spheres of life. I want to see more women, you know, leading organizations. Even if you look at university, uh, they, there are female lecturers, but you rarely find them, you know, as vice chancellors, the deputy vice chancellors, you know, so it's really not there. So I want to see more women. Even young girls leading their schools, becoming captains of class, mm -hmm. you know, and um, becoming, um, you know, a students, you know, president, you find very few women. So I want to see more women, you know, in that position, because once they are in that position, they can become model, you know, for other people. Because I know that one thing that is clear is when women are, when women begin to rule, you know, things would be better for yeah. Africa. So when we so so it's important you know to get women you know to that level of rulership you know to be able to change the face of africa to be able to change the face of nigeria and to be able to change the face of the world so how else do you think we can do that because you part of what you're doing is that i believe and i know you mentor people you know young girls and a lot of other people publicly and secretly and beyond. So how else can we do that? How else can we help young girls, young women into decision making, into leadership? What else, what more can we do? It, I think it's important for us to, um, like in, in the university, we have what we call the purple club, uh, which is like, so we need to form clubs. We started off um, being in clubs, being in uh, literary and debating society. Mm -hmm. We go to the university. We are in uh, um, small society that can empower you. A lot of young mm -hmm. people don't read. I think it's important that we read beyond, you know, what we are taught in class. So we need to uh, have book clubs. You know, uh, open libraries for people. You know, you know, it, it, there are a lot of things going on online. You know, some are beneficial to young people, some are not. You know, people end up spending the whole day playing games and things like that. I think we need to do more, encourage young people to do uh, more than that, to also speak out. You know, if you notice now, the uh, not speaking out is also affecting that generation. Mm -hmm. So they need to, we need to teach them to speak out their mind, you know, uh, to voice their mind. If they're not satisfied with something, they should not be afraid, you know, to say, because the reason why we got to where we are is also because we, we were afraid you know, to say a lot of things out. Mm. So we need to also mentor young people. Uh, we need to have role models, you know. Mm. Uh, we need to have like um, a conglomerate of role models, which I think Impact Africa can do. Bring them together, link mm. them up with young people, you know, and get them to model, to, to mentor them for a period of time, you know. Um, it can be online mentoring, you know, checking out, out on them. What do you want to become? When my son went to school, I realized that he, 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 didn't, he, he went to school in, in the US. He didn't have a role model within the school. And we always need a role model, you know, uh, who can tell you what to do, where to go, you know. 
uh, and probably because it was coming from Africa for the first time. So we need to let them have, uh, at every point in their life, somebody that they are looking up to that can help mm -hmm. them in making their decision. You know, lack of role model can cause, you know, a lot of uh, things for young people. So I think it's important for us to have that, you know, like in an organized way, you know, an organized way. Yeah, and that's why I'm thinking in fact that can, can help us in that regard. <laughs> Interestingly, you've said that we've, uh, through Bold Moves, we're already actually doing that, you know, um, where we have mentors and we work with schools, you know, in a structured way to have mentors, you know, for them within the society, but we still need to develop it a little bit further. And I'm going to throw it back at you because this is something I always do as well when I interview a guest on Impact Africa. If we come to you now, I know you're busy, but I always tell people, the busy people are actually the ones that you get commitment from, really. But you have to be structured and now you commit them. So is that something you wouldn't mind being a mentor? But we will pick, you know, it will be time-based, it will be, you know, is that something you wouldn't mind playing a role, you know, to do that? Yeah, I'm very willing, <laughs> I'm very willing to commit to that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, some, it's very important. We need to all build Africa together. We need to let people learn from the experiences that we have had. You know, because that will help people in making their own decision better. So I am committed to supporting uh, young or old people who are willing. To, I've got uh, it on TV. I've got it on camera. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll add your name to our guest, you know, who are willing, you know, to do that. And we will work with you, you know, on that. So because that's part of the action, but I'm glad you actually brought that up. So my dear sister, Person, friend, I celebrate you. I honor you. Kudos to you for all you're doing. I pray that God will continue to lift you, to guide you, to give you strength, and to surround you, you know, with that village that has always been helping you with what you say, you know, with the women, you know, all the time that you can call, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, what do you need? How can we help? What can we do? So God will keep lifting, you know, all those people for you. And keep doing the best you can. We're rooting for you. Keep flying the flag for our Akiode family from Itoko. We need to give a plug to Abel Kuta. I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you I'm professional now, but we need to hear that because that is important and to our women. And thank God we had strong women, you know, ahead of us as well. You know, our grandmother was very strong, you know, and our mothers yeah. as well. So we thank God, you know, for the women before us who have allowed us to stand on their shoulder. And I believe you will just continue as well to do that. So I salute you. I, I appreciate you. I love you so much. So in closing, I want you to just help me speak to any group of people you want to speak to out there. You know, just to give a, a kind of a last, you know, advice, you know, to them. And yeah, if you could do that. Thank you. I want to speak with young women. This is your time. The world is at your feet. You can make a difference. You can impact Africa. You can do it. Go for it and change the story of women. So I'm calling on all young women across Africa, you know, to take up the leadership position wherever you are. You can make the difference. You can make Africa great. And I believe that you can do that. Wow. Thank you so much, my dear sister. Well, you heard it all from our Dr. Abiola Akioda Fulabi, who is the founder director of what see, which is, I need to get the name right, um, Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center. They're based in Lagos, Nigeria, but they work across Nigeria and they do a lot of work, you know, in Africa and worldwide. We will be sharing their details if you want to support them in any way. If you want to find out more about what they're doing, you heard about the fact that they, you know, they have a shelter. Um, you know, that works with women. They, they do a lot of various things. So there will be always be something you can help or support with, I believe so. So please, we'll share the details at the end. And uh, yeah, till next time.
This is Mama Kate signing off saying, God bless you. Remember, God is love. And till next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye. And well done for what you do.